tonight I'll be ministering on the power of believing. The power of believing. See, I believe that the problem is not faith. The problem is God's ability, I, the problem is God's people's ability to believe what he says. We always say, God, give me more faith. God saying, I'm always speaking. I speak through my word. I speak through the prophets. I speak to your heart. Because what the Lord began to show me is this, faith belongs to God. You and I don't generate faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith does not come from me. Faith comes to me from God. So the title is the power of believing in Jesus Christ. And what God gave me, he says, what is faith? He says, faith comes from God. Faith belongs to God. Faith is given to us by God. Faith is spiritual because God's word is spiritual. Faith is the totality of God's nature, God's word, and God's power. Faith is Jesus Christ. Faith is is the wholeness, the totality, the fullness of who Jesus is. For so long, we almost have been taught how to conjure up, work up, and develop faith. But tonight, I want to tell you that if you believe in what you see in Jesus, you can have faith to remove mountains. You can have faith to do anything that he has called you to do. Because when we believe on the person of Christ, when we believe on the word of Christ, and when we believe in the power and the authority of Christ, there's nothing that is impossible for us. If I would give a subtitle to this message tonight, I would call it looking to Jesus. Because I believe, Meredith, that when we behold him, we are transformed by his image. I want to behold him tonight. I don't want to behold OJ. I don't want to behold a calling. I don't want to behold my circumstances and my situation. Somebody, if I can just see Jesus, I believe this with all my heart. The more I see him, the more I'm changed. Why? Because the more I see him, the more my faith grows. But no matter how much he speaks to me, but listen, faith comes from God, but believing comes from you. Let me tell you a truth tonight. God can't make anybody in here believe. He can lay it out. I was reading the story of, of the children of Israel, and they came to Jeremiah, and they said to Jeremiah, they said, Jeremiah, go and seek your God. Because they was wondering, should they stay in Jerusalem or should they go to Egypt? So they said to Jeremiah, go seek your God, and whatever he tells you, that we shall do. So Jeremiah, for 10 days, went and sought the face of God. And he came back, not with a negative report. He came back with a good report. He says, thus says the Lord, if you will stay in Jerusalem, I will bless you. I will establish you. King Nebuchadnezzar will not come against you. He says, I will even repent for the tragedy of what I brought upon you. So they heard this. They said they would do it. But when the message came from Jeremiah, they didn't believe it. And you know what they did? They went to Egypt. And it cost them everything. That's why the Bible says that the children of Israel are not able to enter the promised land. It's not because they didn't hear the message. It's because they didn't believe what they heard. See, we can call Jesus a healer. But do you really believe it? Y'all, we got to believe this stuff now. We can't just talk it. We can't imitate it in our minds, in our hearts. We got to make a, 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 a sure a statement in my heart, I believe. When God speaks, your heart got to say amen. Because when you say amen to him, then you shall see the manifestation of the power of God. See, somebody's heart tonight need to say amen. Amen to what, OJ? Amen to what I'm about to lay out tonight. And this is what I'm going to lay out tonight. Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. If you can believe that tonight, I believe your life would never be the same. Turn to your Bibles.
I'm going to first read Jer Jeremiah 23 and 18. Jeremiah 23 and 18. Jeremiah 23 and 18. It says, but which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? Who has stood? How do we get faith? By standing in the counsel of God. Well, O.J., who can stand in the counsel of God? Only prophets, only teachers, only apostles, only pastors? No. Paul says that through Christ Jesus, we have been given access to the throne room of grace. How many have it? Everybody in here have it. Now, do everybody take advantage of it? No. But everyone in here can stand in the counsel of the Lord because the Bible says only those who have stood in the counsel of the Lord can truly speak and declare what he has said. See, when Jeremiah was prophesying this, he was talking to the, the line prophets because they was going and they were stealing prophets from other, prophecies from other people. God said to Jeremiah, they're prophesying out of their own mind. They're prophesying about what they see in the world. See, my prophecies, listen to this, cannot be based on what I see in the world. My prophecies have to come out of what he's speaking. Listen, my prophecies and that that he prophesied to me cannot be based on my situations. Because sometimes my situation can mix flesh and spirit and what I am speaking is not of him, it's about my circumstance. But see, when I have stood in the presence of God, I'm not speaking about my circumstances. I am declaring what he has said. OJ, what do they have to do with us? God is saying to his people, it's time for you to stand in my counsel and to hear and see the word of God. For faith comes by what? Hearing. But what we hear and see, we have the power to believe. And I'm not talking about seeing in the natural now. I'm talking about seeing in the spirit. I'm talking about you hearing it, but you're seeing the picture of it. Because I believe that when God drops something, a revelation in your, in your spirit, he begins to give you an image, a picture picture of what he's saying and what he's doing see I came tonight to ask you what are you seeing what, what are you seeing because many times God is speaking we are hearing it with our natural ear but we are not seeing it with our spiritual ear your ear can help you see see I'm not I'm a prophet I don't get visions my visions come by what I see here, I hear, and what I hear, I can see. I see a picture of it because I heard it. And when I stand in his presence and he speak, I can see that that he said. I can see the picture of it because when I see something, I can go towards it. I believe some of us are going in the wrong direction because what we are hearing, we're hearing one thing and we're seeing another. See, somebody can say something to you, and you hear it, but you see something else. The two have to become one. What I hear and what I see should be the word of the Lord. Not my opinion, not man's opinion, not society's opinion. It should be the word of God. All we see. So now, let me read this scripture. It's found in Hebrews, and this is where I'm going. So hearing and seeing. Keep that in mind, hearing and seeing. Hearing, seeing, and believing. Hearing, seeing, and what? Believing. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which would so easily ensnare us. And let us run with endurance, underline that, with endurance, the race that is set before you. 
the race that is set before you, not behind you, before you, or before us. Listen to what it says. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and have sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Therefore, somebody say therefore, since we are surrounded by such great clouds of witnesses. Y'all, when we read the Bible, the Bible becomes a witness to us of the power of God, of the character of God, and of the word of God. Whether you're reading the Old Testament or the New Testament. See, if you want to know the character of God, if you want to know the power of God, you got to read the whole Bible. You can't just set, select your favorite book because the Bible is a picture of how awesome and how mighty and how faithful and how good and how merciful and how kind our God is. Y'all, God's kindness, God's mercy, and God's grace did not begin in the New Testament. God was merciful in the Old Testament just like the New Testament. God forgave sin in the Old Testament like he forgave sin in the New Testament. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And when you read the Bible, and this is what I love about the Old Testament, it's real stories. See, I don't know how Paul lived his life. Because what I read about Paul is a letter to the church. But when I read about David, I see one who interacted with God. Some people say, I don't read the Old Testament because we're under the grace and not under the law. But if you don't understand the old, how can you understand the new? Because when David sinned against God, the law said that he should be killed. That's what the law said. But what mercy said, go tell David. This is not unto death. So when I see that story, and that's what David said in the Psalms. He said, blessed is the man whose sin is not held against him. See, when I read the story of David, I can see how God can take a shepherd boy who was not his father's favorite son. Who was on the backside of a desert taking care of a very a small amount of sheep. And one day, Samuel the prophet showed up. And he went through all the songs looking for a king and he found none. And he says, do you have any? They say, yeah, we have that little David back there somewhere. He says, go get him. And the Bible says when David showed up, God says, that's the man. Y'all, what it's telling me, God can take nothing and make it out of something. So it's not where we came from and it's not what we have gone through. It's who he is. That's why the scripture says these witnesses testified not about their situation. They testify about the goodness, the mercy, and the grace of our God. What are they being witness about? Not what they went through. It's how he brought them out. We get caught up and excited about the Red Sea, but we don't look at the God who brought them through the Red Sea. We can get caught up in Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, but the point of him raising Lazarus from the dead was not about Lazarus coming out of a tomb. It was about the people knowing that he is the resurrection and the life. That he is what? The resurrection and the life. And y'all, this is the good news. If he's the resurrection then, he's the resurrection now. So though you're dead, you can still live. Why? Because I have a revelation that Jesus Christ is the uh, 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 resurrection and Jesus Christ is my life. The real question is, do you believe? Do you uh, believe? And when we believe, we got to come out of our boxes. We got to come out. It says forgetting those things behind. Lay aside every weight. And weights ain't sin. Weights are the things, the troubles of life that burdens you down. And as long as you live in this life, let me tell you, you're going to have some troubles now. Y'all, th th this gospel, it brings trouble with it. Jesus said it like this. He said there will be many. He says many. He didn't say some now. 
He didn't say one or two. He didn't say because you love me, you have surrendered to me, you ain't going to have no problems. He says in this life, in this world, there are going to be many troubles. Many. But he don't stop there. This is the good news. But be of good what? Cheers. Because who? I have overcome. Watch this. If I'm in him and he overcomes, y'all want to know what that means? I've overcome with him. Why did you overcome, OJ? Because I'm in him. I didn't overcome because I did something great. I overcame because I believed that I was in Jesus. And if Jesus said he has overcome, then I can praise him because I have already overcame. Because I'm in him. And what puts me in him is not my good and my bad. It's the finished work of the cross. What put me in his grace, what puts me in his mercy is what he did on Calvary. I believed it. I accepted it. And today I'm in him. And as long as I'm in him and I'm walking well with him, no matter what I'm going through, the good news is I'm going to overcome. So say to Hit me with your best shot. Because guess what? It ain't me you need to worry about. It's him you need to be worrying about. Because you don't understand saying I'm in him. So you're not fighting me. You're fighting him. You're not fighting me. You're fighting the body of Christ. He's fighting us. Because we're the body. That's why we got to understand we are the what? Body. So when Satan attacks one of us, watch this, he's attacking all of us. But you got to lay aside those things. You got to put aside the sins of the past. This is what the scripture says. In Romans 8, it says you was crucified with Christ. You was buried with Christ. You was resurrected with Christ. And it says, and I know that the old man is dead. Did somebody hear that? The old man is dead. Why we spend all our Christian world wrestling with sin? Wrestling with the sins of the past. I can't overcome this. I can't overcome jealousy. I can't overcome pride. The real issue, do you believe? That through Christ Jesus, it's not a five-step program how to get set free. Freedom is in the power of the cross. When I believe that this old man, that old OJ, that could get angry at the drop of a dime. See, if I still talk about that old OJ as if he's still alive. See, some of us, we talk about that old nature. You know why? Because we still like it. We still feed it. We still give it life. But... You come to a place in your life that you realize that in Christ Jesus, that old man is dead. And every time that old man try to raise his head, you got to open your mouth and tell him, no, you died in Christ. And now the body of sin in me has been done away with. And I'm no longer a slave to sin, but I'm a slave to righteousness. I'm not a slave to righteousness because I feel it. I'm a slave to righteousness because I know it. And how do I know it? Because I'm in him. He's in me. And as he has been resurrected, so have I been resurrected. Y'all, this is the real true good news of the cross. When you and I can believe this good news, we should be shouting and dancing. You know, we, we spend more time sometimes talking about stuff like, well, you know, God knows I'm weak. Well, you know, you know, we all live in this sinful nature, not according to Romans. Because according to Romans, it should be dead. And if it's not dead, you better go back to the cross. Because it's dead. But we got to believe it. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant it. Y'all, it's finished. My past is what? Finished. So he says, lay what? Aside those things. And then he says, when you, when you lay them what? Aside, guess what? Then and only then can you run the race. So let me tell you, you can't run in this life weighted down. Some of us trying to do the will of God and we still weighted down. 
with our past. We still weighted down with unforgiveness. We still weighted down with bitterness. We still weighted down with shame. Lust, pride, greed. And we wonder why we're moving at a slow pace. And we're barely moving. And you know why we're barely moving? Because we're trying to carry the weight of the past with us. We, we, we're carrying the pains of being rejected in the church with us. You, you know, they, they hurt my feelings. They offended me, and so I carry with me. My mama wasn't in my life. My daddy wasn't in my life. So I carry it with me. But Paul says that's a race he's given to each one of us. I, I stopped by to ask you today, are you running your race? And are you running at the pace that he's given you, or are you trying to run it pulling a heavy load? I'm going to tell you, I could prophesy over you all day. If you're running this race pulling a heavy load, prophecy ain't going to change you. What prophecy should do is cut off the load. It should what? Cut it what? Off. When we minister to people, we should be cutting stuff off of people. See, I don't deny people's hurt. I don't deny people's pain. But as a minister of the gospel, which we all are, we should not leave them in their hurt and their pain. Through the power of Jesus Christ, we have been given authority to cut it off. How do I cut off sin then, OJ? You tell people you've been forgiven. Jesus did it. Get up and move on. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and he was like, OJ, how long I got to go through this overcome where I, 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 I'm going backwards? I said, okay, let me tell you something. He did it, right? You, when you first got saved, he delivered you through the cross. Now that you have gone backwards in an area, know this day, the power is still in the cross. And once you believe that, he forgives you, according to John, 1 John, he washes you, you get up, and you move on. You know what the church do? We tell people, now you got to go through 10 loops. Now you got to really feel this thing. No, I've been feeling it for a long time. You don't know how long I've been carrying this burden. And you want to keep the burden on me? No, I got to let this go. Not only do I got to let the, 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 the pain of it go, but I got to believe that Jesus has the power to make me whole. See, what y'all don't understand, I can't stay in the place I used to be in anymore because I got a race that I got to run. And listen, I don't want to get to heaven and miss it. I don't want him to say, I want him to say this, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well what? Done. Well what? Done. Why? Because you ran the race, OJ, that I set before you. And see, when I stand before him, can I tell you, I ain't going to have no excuses. I ain't going to be able to blame the church, the pastor, the preachers, the teachers. Because he's going to ask me a question. Did you have the Holy Ghost? Did you have my word? Did you know my voice? I gave you a race to run. Why didn't you run it? I can't go back and say, but God, you, you know my past. He said, but I heal your past on the cross. I, it, see, when, when, when God does a thing, there's no shame left. There's no guilt left. You are free. It's the world that he heaps, it's the church sometimes that heaps shame on you. Make you feel guilty. But you know, this is what I believe. The Bible says this. It says you overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony and loving not your life even until the point of death. Let me tell you, when you share your story, who can stop you? It don't even matter anymore. It don't matter what I went through. It don't matter what I have came out of. It, what really matters is who I am in him. And guess what? I'm running this race, but I'm not just running it for myself. I'm running for my children. I'm running this race for my wife. Because guess what? As I run, she's running with me. And we are helping each other along the journey, and we're running it together. Why? Because sometimes I fall down, and she has to pick me up. And sometimes she falls down, and I have to pick her up. But I'm running 
to achieve something. Paul tells us what we need to achieve. He says, looking to Jesus. Looking to who? Jesus. And when he say looking to Jesus, he's telling you, you need to look to the totality of who Jesus is. You got to look to him as a healer. We have to look to him as a deliverer. We have to look to him as a savior. We have to look to him as a comforter. We have to look to him as a friend. We have to look to him as a brother. We have to look to Jesus. What are you looking at? Are you looking at politics or are you looking at Jesus? Are you looking at your bank account or are you looking at Jesus? Are you looking at your marriage or are you looking at Jesus? Are you looking at your church or are you looking at Jesus? Are you looking at your circumstances or are we looking at Jesus? Because when we behold him, we can hear him. Because he's looking us in the face and saying, I'm speaking to where you are. Y'all, this relationship is so real with Jesus. Oh, when you set your eyes upon him, you see him as he is. You know when he's smiling and you know when he's not. You know when he has wrapped his arms around you and you know when he's disciplined you. But you're looking to him. See, if we ever started really looking to Jesus, we'll, want, we'll start wondering about what am I called to do? You know why? Because if I'm looking at him, I'm just going to do what he's doing. Am I a prophet? No. What is he doing? What is he saying? Is God still healing? He's going to heal tomorrow. A revival is coming. A revival is for anybody who can look at Jesus and produce what he's doing. I'm going to say that again. A true revival is anybody who can look at Jesus and produce what he is doing. Are you producing what he's doing? Or are we trying to produce stuff out of our flesh? The Bible says the flesh gives birth to the what? Flesh. And the spirit gives birth to the what? Spirit. You cannot produce God things out of the flesh. Jesus said it like this to the, to the Pharisees. He says, I only do what I see my father doing. I only do what I see him doing. I only say what I hear him what? Saying, I start out by saying, who is standing in the council of the most high God? Because those who are standing in the council of the most high God going to say like Jesus, I only do what I see him doing. I only say. What I hear him saying. If he's saying to me, I am the Lord that healeth thee, then guess what I'm saying? He is the Lord that heals me. If he's saying to me, I am your bread of life, then what am I saying? He is my bread of life. I'm saying what he's saying. I'm not saying what the doctor is saying. I'm not saying what society is saying. I'm not saying what the net, the latest, greatest fad is saying in the church. I'm saying what he is saying. And how do you know it's of him? Because what you're going to find in the spirit is agreement. See, if I can look at Jesus, then I don't worry about my children. Because this is the point. When you look at him, you realize this. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. Y'all, this is the good news of what I'm preaching today. Jesus has already written your story. David said before the foundation of where my story was already penned. Do you know God has already penned your story? The real issue is not what God is saying. It's who is able to see him, to hear him. Because I believe tonight if you can see him, you can hear him. And you can see the author has already written the book. And guess what? In a good story, it has different plots and themes and everything else. It has ups and it has downs, but the story has been what? Written. 
And sometimes, listen, we can't change the story. I remember when I was 20 years old, the Lord spoke to me and he told me, he said, go write your mother a letter. Because I'm about to take her home. He told me this. I put my hand in my ears and said, I don't want to hear. I said, God, no, that's not my portion. Then I was listening to a song about I remember mama and I start weeping. And I don't cry that easy. He was speaking. Then I was living in another state and I went back to Houston and on my way, it was Christmas and I was leaving. And he said, you'll never see your mom like this again. But I put my hand in my ear. Why? Because I didn't want to hear his story. It took me five years to overcome the grief. I was angry with God. Why were you angry, OJ? OJ, because he didn't write the story the way I wanted it written. I wanted him to heal my mom of cancer. Could he do it? Yes. But he told me, he said, he told me clearly. He says, her race on this earth is finished. I'm taking her home. I fought him. I fought him. And then when he didn't do it my way, I got mad. But guess what? That was a part of her story. But when I preached her eulogy, he gave me this. Her children will rise and call her blessed. And I heard him say, though a seed falls to the ground and die, it shall what? Multiply. Even though my mother was dead, her children will become the multiplication in Christ for her. Because God, our God, will multiply our lives through her. We became the testimony. I pray, y'all. But the story was different. Did I lack faith? No, because my faith was God was going to do it. But I can't have faith beyond what's written sometimes. But if he had said she's going to rise again, then guess what? That would have changed the whole story. This is what I'm saying about that is. If you will really listen to God, you won't have to be fearing for your life. He already knows the end. He already knows. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow. That's why the scripture said, give me what? This day. My daily bread. And see, get David understood that about God. So when a wicked king came and took out his whole family, and the Bible says his own men wanted to kill him. They wanted to take him out. The Bible says, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. And they all know what David did. He went and sought the face of God. And he says, God, shall I go up and attack them? God says, yes. Watch how dependent he was on God. Most of us at that point, we'd have jumped in our chairs and we'd have took off. But he says, God, I got to ask you one more question. Will you give me the victory? God says, I'm going to give you the victory. See, when you and I understand he's the author and the finisher of your faith, then you begin to seek him more about your life, your destiny, your children. You say, you know what? I'm not fearing anymore. I'm not worrying about my calling and my purpose. I'm, if you got, if you sick in your body, look to him. Oh, we won't ask him, God, are you going to heal me? You can ask him that. He'll tell you. And many times he tells us stuff and we won't believe it. He said, I'm going to heal you. Then he'll send somebody else say, I'm going to heal you. And everybody's saying, I'm going to heal you. And we still say, God, but what about me? The point of my message is this, do we believe that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith? Do we believe that nothing can happen to us in this life without the author having something to say about it? See, when you walk in this place, you don't fear, you ain't wondering how you're going to get married, who you're going to marry. You just go to the author. And you say, years ago, you knew who my husband would be. You knew who my wife would be. Show me. If your children are going through, stop worrying. Go to the author and say, you already wrote their story. Just begin to show it to me. And out of nowhere, he'll show them free from drugs. He'll show them in the kingdom, worship. You'll see their hands lifted up and they worship in him. Why? Because you went to the author of life. 
He that wrote the story. Who's going to seek it? You got to read the book. If you don't read, you'll never know the end. It's time to read your story in Christ. And Christ will say to you tonight as I close, I want to reveal your story. I want to show you my purpose. And the Bible says he's concerned about everything that concerns you. So even the smallest details of our life, he'll show us. But we got to look at the author. And see what he's writing. And can I tell you a truth? He knows the story. Let him write it. And even if you mess up. He ain't going to rewrite the story. He's going to finish his story. You just got to get back in agreement with it. Because he is the author. And the finisher of our faith. Do we believe?